I'm going to measure 20 milliliters of water using a graduated cylinder. Now, to make this measurement, I'm going to bend down here to keep this kind of at eye level. Uh, you tend to make mistakes when reading volume measurements when you read them at an angle. So I keep it here at a nice steady level, uh, so we're able to see that this is at 20 milliliters. Okay, you guys get a little better look at this. All right. Uh, actually, I'll probably bring the webcam up so you can kind of see it at uh, eye level. Uh, notice that the uh, bottom of that curve formed by the water. Uh, is what's touching that line representing 20 milliliters, right? Uh, that bottom of that curve is known as the lower meniscus. And typically, the uh, any liquid like water that tends to uh, uh, get sort of attracted to a surface, uh, you know, basically has some surface tension, uh, will tend to rise up the sides of the container it's in. Um, so when you want to make a good volume reading, you're going to read that lower meniscus uh, to get a better idea of what the actual volume is. Now, notice that you have to see this kind of at eye level to really see that that volume is correct. If you try to read this at an angle, notice how the level seems to change. All right? This is known as parallax error. And it's something you typically want to avoid, uh, a mistake you want to avoid making when, when taking volume readings like this. We are now going to weigh out a clean, dry beaker. To do this, we obviously need the beaker itself, but we also need what's known as a mass balance, or a scale. Um, basically, the display on our scale, or a mass balance, as you can see here, uh, is currently not zeroed. So before we begin, we have to make sure that it is canceled out or teared. Uh, to do this, you press the tear button. Uh, tear, by the way, is spelled T-A-R-E, uh, though it's not technically spelled out here. Uh, and so you just click that, and you'll notice that the scale winds up zeroing. Now we will then open up our sliding glass door, add in our nice clean dry beaker, you can see that when we do that, the uh, scale fluctuates and eventually settles on a number. Uh, by the way, when uh, if something is still bouncing around on that scale, uh, you'll notice the number is changing quite a bit. So here to show you that, I'll just like lift and lower that uh, beaker, and you can see that it moves around. When it is done settling, close this to make sure no wind disturbs it you'll notice that there is a little asterisk that appears to let you know that this is kind of staying relatively steady. Uh, so when it does that, that's the reading you want to go with. Now another very important thing to, to note about readings here is the uh, all the decimal places that your reading has listed. When you are recording this mass, you need to write all of those down. Okay, that you can't just round this off to 28.9 or 29 grams. Uh, that 0.852 is useful information that your scale is giving to you. All, right? All of those digits that the scale provides to you are what are called significant figures. And this is something that will come in handy when we start doing calculations. So we'll make a note of that. Uh, the mass of our clean dry beaker is 28.852 grams. When I took the measurement of the volume itself, I pointed out that I accurately measured out 20 milliliters. What I did not point out was how to record that volume according to significant figures, kind of like how we did for our mass reading of our clean dry beaker. So uh, please note that when you look at this graduated cylinder, each of these bigger lines marks 10 milliliter markings, so 10, 20, 30, etc. Notice that as we um, you know, zoom in on that, all right, 
each of those uh, lines, or each of those sections, is subdivided into 10 smaller markings, right? So each of those individual small lines represents one milliliter. So if that's that long line over there is 10 milliliters, that's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on, all the way up to 20, right? So since each division marks an individual milliliter, when we record this volume, we have to record to the nearest milliliter because that's as accurate, or as precise rather, uh, that our graduate cylinder can record. Um, so yeah, so we would write down that volume reading as 20 milliliters exactly. We wouldn't add any decimal places, nothing like that. Okay, now we then have to add our water to our nice clean dry beaker, which we're going to do. The volume markings on beakers tend to be neither accurate nor precise. Uh, you can notice that the individual markings here are to the nearest 10 milliliters. Uh, again, this is why we use a measuring cylinder, a uh, graduated cylinder rather, to measure volumes a little bit more precisely and of course a little bit more accurately. Anyway, let's now get the mass of our water. To do that, we're going to go back to our mass balance. Uh, notice that it is still teared at zero, right? If it isn't, this would be a good time to hit that tear button to reset that to zero, but in this case it already is, so no need to do that. Uh, we're then going to go ahead and open up our sliding glass door, add our beaker, close the glass door, and now make a note of the volume, or sorry, the mass reading on our Beaker, uh, on our mass balance. Right? Again, notice that the asterisks over there let us know that this is a good stable reading and we can go with that value. With the information from our clean dry beaker and the water we measured in our graduated cylinder and then that we poured into said clean dry beaker, you should be able to figure out the density of water by following the prompts in your lab report. We are now going to do the same thing for an unknown liquid. Uh, the identity of the liquid itself isn't that important for this lab, so even though there's a field to enter that, uh, don't stress too much about it. That's more to worry about if we had more than one unknown that we were dealing with here. Um, but basically, we're going to follow the same set of instructions. We're going to weigh out of or measure out a volume of about 20 milliliters of this unknown liquid. We are then going to um, weigh out the liquid by subtracting its mass in a beaker from the mass of the empty beaker, just like we did for water. So let us start with that. And notice I'm kind of lowering down to... I don't know if you can, because you can't really see my face here, but I'm basically looking at this at eye level. All right, now I've kind of overshot a little bit. Instead of being at exactly 20 milliliters, you might not be able to see this, but if I, maybe if I put this at eye level, you'll notice that I've actually gone past 20 milliliters. I'm a little bit closer, uh, well, a little bit under 21. So we are going to, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add a little bit more of this unknown liquid. And instead of using 20 milliliters, I'm actually going to use 21 milliliters. Now, even though the instructions say to pour 20 milliliters, it's okay to do this because that's the nice thing about density the density will remain the same regardless of the volume I use. I'm just pouring up to 21 milliliters just so I have a more accurate volume. There we go. Since the, um, the volume I had in the graduate cylinder was more than 20 milliliters but not quite 21, I didn't want uh, to use uh, that volume because then I would be guessing what the decimal point would be. And we don't want to guess when it comes to measurements. We want to measure, 
right? So now if you look at this, the lower meniscus, we're looking at this at eye level, the lower meniscus of that line is touching that smaller notch above the notch marking 20. So that's the 21 milliliter line. You can see that the, um, the lower meniscus is touching that line, and that's what we're going to make a note of for our volume of 21 milliliters. Now, when it comes to measuring the mass of our beaker, like we did before, please note that we're still going to take all the same steps we did before, even if we're using the same beaker. Do not make the assumption that the mass of your beaker has not changed. Okay, uh, There could be any number of things that, in the grand scheme of things, are very small differences in mass. But you have to remember that a very sensitive mass balance like this, which can go to a thousandth of a gram, um, is something that you want to be careful with when you're making your measurements, when you're trying to be accurate in your measurements. So with that in mind, we're going to follow the same procedure as before. We're going to make sure that this is teared. And if, it, if those weren't, aren't all zeros, uh, we would then tear the balance, right? T-A-R-E, the balance. Uh, we're going to go ahead and put in our clean, dry beaker. And make a note of the mass once this has come to rest. Okay, make a note uh, once this has stabilized that this is the mass of our clean, dry beaker. When you've done that, let's go ahead and take out our beaker, pour in our 21 milliliters of unknown liquid, and then proceed to take the mass of that. So again, make sure that we're still at zero. Go ahead and add in our, our beaker and close the door. And please note the mass of our beaker with our 21 milliliters of, um, of our unknown liquid. And then based on that information and the information of the empty beaker and the volume of the liquid, you should be able to calculate the density of that liquid, just as we did for water. We've just calculated the density of water and an unknown liquid by measuring mass and volume. There's a different way to measure the density of a liquid, and that is through specific gravity. Now, to measure specific gravity, we're going to use a device called a hydrometer. And I'll explain how that works in a second. But first of all, let's explain what specific gravity is. Specific gravity is quite simply the density of a liquid divided by the density of water. Now, since the density of water is one gram per milliliter, uh, the numerical value of specific gravity is going to be the same as the value of the density. The only difference between specific gravity and density is that specific gravity is unitless, is just a number, uh, since the units cancel out when you divide the density of your liquid by the density of water. So over here, we have two graduated cylinders, one with, our, with pure water, another with our unknown liquid. And we have a couple of hydrometers here that we're going to use to measure the, uh, the specific gravity of these two liquids probably can't see these too well due to the glare. I'll take a better angle picture in a little bit. All right. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and put these guys in there. And you can see how the way these hydrometers float will tell us the specific gravity, and therefore the density, of the liquids that they are floating in. Cool. I've gone ahead and put in a hydrometer into the graduate cylinder with pure water. Now uh, you'll notice that uh, well, two things. One, when I uh, first put in the graduated cylinder, or sorry, the hydrometer and leave it alone, it tends to stick to one side of the, uh, of the graduated cylinder. Uh, another thing to notice is the air bubble that it sometimes picks up when you initially drop it into the graduated cylinder. 
So when you're using a hydrometer, one of the things you want to do to avoid issues with this is to give it a gentle spin. So I'm going to pick it up, give it a gentle spin. So I'll get rid of some of the air bubbles. As this spins gently, hopefully you should get a glimpse of the markings on the uh, hydrometer and make a note of where the water level intersects with the hydrometer. Okay, so again, you want to read this at eye level, avoiding parallax error. Okay, so make a note of where that intersects. Now, the thing you want to watch out for is what are each of those markings equivalent to. Notice that as we go down the hydrometer, let me pull it out so you can see this a little bit better. see that the individual uh, markings here uh, go to a very precise amount. Like each of these markings, the larger markings, goes to three decimal places, okay, starting at 1.000 uh, and going all the way down to, you know, the next one would be 1.005. So each of those notches in between is going to be 0.001 to units of specific gravity, which our unit is just a number. Now notice that if we turn this a little bit more, each of those little lines is in between 0.001. So each of those is 0 0.005. So something to keep in mind for when you're trying to read a hydrometer. Okay, so I'm going to drop this back in again so we can make that reading one more time. But make a note, when we look at this at eye level, which marking is it touching? Now, it's a little hard to see because of that tendency of water, like other, uh, certain other liquids, to sort of rise up along the edges of our graduate cylinder. So it's making that edge, that, that level, seem a little bit thicker than it actually is. So it might be a little hard, but remember, we're going off that lower meniscus. So you're reading the bottom of that curve, you want to try and figure out what marking does that correspond to. So it's clearly going to be a number that's greater than 1.000, right? Because that's at the top, and the numbers, as you notice, increase as you go down the hydrometer. So the question you should ask yourself is, how many markings down does it go? Okay. So there's that. I'm going to just turn this a little bit, see if you can see it that way. Gonna move it a little bit just to give you a little bit of a better. So you can see some of the smaller markings as well. You can use that to make your reading. Okay. If it's harder to try and count up, you can try counting backwards. So if we know that this marking down here is 1.005, you know we can work backwards to say, okay, well that must be, and go from there. I've cleaned and dried the hydrometer and put it into the graduate cylinder with our unknown liquid. Okay, again, it's doing the same thing where it's kind of sticking to the side, so we're going to give it that gentle spin to help pull it off. Notice that our hydrometer kind of bobbing up a little bit more in this unknown liquid, which should tell us that the unknown liquid is going to be denser than water, which again, you probably already know. But if you hadn't figured that out from your calculations, you should be able to figure it now by looking at this hydrometer. All right? uh, again, remember things that are uh, denser, liquids that are denser, will have objects be more buoyant. So once again, let's read this avoiding parallax error. See as this spins slowly, see where that lower meniscus is intersecting your graduated, uh, your uh, hydrometer. Try and turn that around so we hopefully you get a better view of what that reading might be.
In this section, we're going to figure out the density of an unknown metal. Now, to give your instructor uh, some variance, uh, or rather give you guys some variety of data, uh, so you guys aren't all doing the same experiment, uh, I actually have three different uh, unknowns for you guys to try out. Now, please only select one uh, and make a note of it in your lab report so that your instructor knows how to grade you appropriately. But Basically, we have unknowns labeled, arbitrarily, unknown number 5 over here. We have unknown number 14, this nice sort of coppery color. Uh, I don't know if it actually is copper or not. Uh, I actually don't know what the unknowns are as I'm filming this, so it'll be a surprise for all of us. Uh, we also have uh, unknown number 20 here, so we'll uh, figure that out as we go along. Okay, so first step is to get the mass of our unknown. So I'm going to do my measurements for these all at the same time. Again, when you are doing your lab report, please select only one of these unknowns, uh, and your instructor might uh, give you a specific unknown to try so that, uh, you know, everyone in the class isn't doing the same unknown. All right, so let's start off with unknown number five. I'm going to take it out of its container here. Okay, now uh, let's go ahead and have a look at our mass balance. Okay, as always, remember you want your uh, mass balance to be teared or zeroed before uh, beginning, and in this case it already is, so we don't have to do anything. Let's go ahead and slide open the door, add our little metal cylinder to that, and there's the reading for unknown number five. Okay, so unknown number five, has that reading. Make a note of that if unknown number five is your unknown. Here's unknown number 14. Okay, so again, our balance here is teared. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up our, oops. There we go. Let's go ahead and open that up and put that there. Oot. And here we have it, the mass reading for unknown number 14. Okay, so once again, unknown number 14, here is the mass of that unknown. So here we have unknown number 20. So let's go ahead and do that. So once again, our mass, our balance is zeroed. Let's close. That. Move that to settle. Looks like it's a little wobbly. Ah, there we go. Okay, and there we have the mass for unknown number 20. So if your unknown is number 20, please make a note of this mass. All right, let's move on and figure out the volumes of our unknown cylinders. All righty, so we are now going to get the volumes of our metal cylinders. Uh, in order to measure these volumes, I'm going to gently drop these into a graduated cylinder of water, which we will uh, you know, make a note of the change in volume, uh, and that displaced volume of water will correspond to the volume of the cylinder that has been dropped into that graduated cylinder. So, in order to uh, make sure we don't crack these glass graduated cylinders, I am going to tie string around our metal cylinders, kind of like how I've done here. Okay, so this is unknown number uh, f five that I've gone ahead and tied up. Uh, just so you see how to do this, um, you know, if you ever have to do this in person, uh, I'll go ahead and do the same thing for unknown number 14 here. Now, it's as simple as tying a string, uh, tying a knot in a string, but I figured I'd go over it just to, you know, just so you can see what it would look like if you had done it yourself in person. So we go ahead and cut the piece of string, okay, and uh, tie a knot over here like so. Now what I like to do, because these are a little bit slidey, uh, tie this as tight as possible and put a double knot. there and that will hopefully keep that secure and avoid it untying while it's inside your graduate cylinder. Now you notice that we have a little bit of excess string over here which I'm going to then trim with my scissors. 
All right, now the string shouldn't make a significant difference in your volume. Uh, your volume's pretty much, uh, you know, the volume of a string is very, very low. So it's not really going to affect your volume reading that much, uh, especially given the low precision of these graduated cylinders. Uh, but that being said, it doesn't hurt to trim it down a little bit to minimize this effect. Okay, so uh, I will go ahead and do the same for unknown 20 uh, off camera and then we'll get ready to get our volume measurements. Alrighty, let's get ready to get our volume by displacement. Uh, so once again, uh, you want to read your graduated cylinder by avoiding parallax error. So you want to have this visible at eye level, right? So I'm kind of putting the webcam here about the level that you would, uh, you know, the way you would look at this if you were seeing this in person. Uh, so you can make a note of that uh, location of that lower meniscus, the bottom of that curve, uh, you can see is at that 21 milliliter mark. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, we're going to add our our uh, piece of metal. So this is unknown number five that we're going to start with. Okay, uh, so here we have it, unknown number five. Uh, again, notice that we start off with enough water in our graduated cylinder to cover are our, our, um, a metal object. Sorry, it's kind of hard to show you this without my hand in the way, but basically rest assured that it is enough water. Um, you also want to make sure that there is enough room in your graduated cylinder to allow the water you're displacing uh, to rise up and be measured. You don't want to have your water level filled all the way to the top uh, so that when the water gets displaced, you can't measure the new volume. So let's go ahead and, uh, you know, so right now about 20 milliliters is right about where we want it to be. So let's go ahead and gently lower the graduated cylinder into our sample. So I'm going to set this down. I've got a little clipboard here to help make reading the graduated cylinder a little bit easier. But just so I can use both hands here. I'm going to go ahead and lower, whoops, that's that a little bit easier. All right, so go ahead and lower very gently, whoops, <laughs> hopefully without splashing it like that, lower our graduate cylinder into our, oh, sorry, our metal cylinder into our graduate cylinder. So now let's go ahead and read that volume marking. So again, you should be able to read that lower meniscus and based on the markings it's next to, figure out what that new volume is. Okay, so with that new volume in mind, ask yourself what must the volume of the metal cylinder be? Okay, okay. so that is the volume again for unknown number five. Here we have unknown number 14. We're gonna go ahead and get a measurement for that. So before we begin, of course, First, we need to double check what is our reading of our initial volume. Okay, again, it has stayed about the same. We can, can see that lower meniscus there, avoiding parallax error. We can see what that initial volume is. Um, and then let's go ahead and add unknown number 14. So there. Very gently lower it in until it's the bottom. I'm going to keep the string relatively you know, not too loose, so not too much of you know, excess is in the water. Not that it makes much of a difference. And let's go ahead and get that volume reading. Let's see, sorry, try and get that back in focus. There we go. Yeah, hopefully you should be able to see that lower meniscus and which marking it's touching. Okay, again, this is only as precise as the nearest milliliter. As you can tell, each of those smaller markings is one milliliter. Uh, so when you're writing this down, please do not invent decimal points or uh, decimal places. Just write down the nearest milliliter marking. Okay, and once again, that was unknown number 14. Here's the readings for the volume readings for unknown number 20. Okay, so once again, we need to start off by looking at the um, our initial volume reading. So once this settles, there we go. 
Looks like our initial volume reading hasn't really changed, even though there's probably a couple of drops here and there that stuck to our graduated cylinders, but it doesn't look like it's affected too much. Um, yeah, so it's about that. Again, this is not a very, very precise uh, graduated cylinder, so we have a little bit of leeway, even if a couple of drops uh, have left here and there. Uh, so let's go ahead and add in unknown number 20. So very gently lower it into our graduated cylinder. See the water level rising. And once again, let's make a note of what our new volume reading is. Once this comes back into focus, hopefully. There we go. Yeah, this one's a little trickier because it looks like if I avoid parallax error, it's sort of in between two readings. Uh, you can see if you look at the bottom of that meniscus, unless, hold on, maybe I just don't have this lined up properly. Nope, that's, yeah, there we go. So that meniscus is actually in between two readings. Uh, I think here it would be acceptable to estimate that that is a half a milliliter in between there, all right? Uh, so if it's in between two readings, uh, you can put, go to, you can put a 0.5 as a decimal place, uh, and that's acceptable. Though again, keep in mind from a significant figure standpoint, um, you know, that one isn't as precise as you would expect. Um, so this is where you sometimes see measurements having a uh, sort of um, error, um, an error range listed after them, where they'll say, oh, plus or minus 0.5 uh, milliliters, for example, for this volume reading. Okay. All righty. So that is our volume reading for unknown number 20. Okay, so we are now going to determine the density of these post-1982 pennies uh, through uh, displacement to determine the volume uh, and measure their mass using mass balance, just like we did with our regular metal cylinders. Uh, but the neat thing we're going to do here is we're going to get the average density of all these pennies by a graphical method as opposed to just simply adding up a bunch of numbers and dividing to take a mean. Uh, instead, we're going to draw a graph where we're going to plot a graph of our measurements and then draw what's called a line of best fit. And using that, we can essentially uh, determine the average for the density of the metals making these pennies. Now, uh, the reason, by the way, that we're using post-1982 pennies uh, is that uh, in 1982, or at least by 1982, uh, the price of copper had risen so much that it cost more than a penny to make a penny. Uh, so starting in 1982, they took zinc discs and coated them with copper. And that is how pennies are made to this day. Uh, of course, we're already at the point that it's you know, again, it costs more than a penny to make these pennies, even, uh, you know, with these cheaper zinc discs in the middle of them. Um, so who knows, maybe uh, the days for pennies in general are numbered. But in any case, let us, uh, you know, get started with this. Uh, in order to begin, of course, we need to know our initial volume and initial mass of the water we're going to be using for our displacement. So I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, have us look at that starting volume. Okay, again, read that lower meniscus to get the volume. Uh, so the bottom of that curve, you can see uh, what volume reading it's at. Okay, so that's going to be our starting point. So I'm going to then also get a mass reading for this uh, so that then we can um, accordingly use that for our, you know, sort of our starting point. Uh, because we're going to have to subtract that from our future readings to get the mass and volume of only the pennies. All right. All righty. So here we have our, grad, our uh, mass balance to get our mass of our graduated cylinder. As always, we're going to make sure that our balance is teared before we begin. Now, our graduated cylinder is pretty tall. Uh, I would say tall enough that it's probably not going to fit this through the side door. Luckily, our mass balance has a top door that we can slide open to lower our graduate cylinder into. So let's do that. And 
and you can see that this is the mass of our graduated cylinder with the water in it that we're going to use for determining the mass and volume readings of our pennies. Okay, so here's our graduated cylinder, here are our pennies. Um, I found that usually adding just one penny at a time isn't really sufficient for n getting a noticeable difference in volume. So we're actually going to add a couple pennies, maybe two or three at a time, uh, and see if that makes a big enough difference. Uh, basically, we should add enough pennies in each of our readings. There we go. Oh, that fits pretty well into that graduated cylinder. It's kind of neat. Uh, but basically, I think I'm going to add enough, uh, you know, enough pennies at a time. Oh, it's kind of fun, actually. <laughs> um, sorry, I got distracted there by how, uh, like, neatly these pennies fit into the diameter of this graduated cylinder. Um, I'm easily amused. I should probably, uh, I don't know, maybe take another take of this. But anyway, uh, I'm going to add enough pennies so that our volume rises by about a milliliter each time. Uh, if you add just one penny, that's not going to be sufficient, but two or three seem to do the trick. So maybe I'll just add a third one, just to be on the safe side. There we go. Okay, that I think brings us up to 22. So that's, that's a nice round number. So uh, yeah, go ahead and make a note of that new volume. Okay. So the number of pennies is what's important. What's important there is that change in volume. So make a note of that volume over there. And now let's go ahead and measure the mass of this same graduate cylinder. So again, notice that this is teared. I'm going to add our graduate cylinder with the pennies and the water to this. Okay, and it stopped moving. And please make a note of the uh, mass with our first set of pennies added. Okay, with that in mind, let's go ahead and add a couple more pennies. Let's add a couple more pennies. One, two. Is that enough to get our volume reading up? Looks like it is. So I'll go ahead and take to that reading. Let's see if that's a little... There we go. Hopefully that should be easy enough to read. Okay, so you can see the new volume reading there. I'm having trouble seeing it there. Okay, so that's the new volume reading. And let's go ahead and get the mass of that reading as well. Or sorry, if that... Again, that's uh, teared. Let's go ahead and add our graduate cylinder. Okay, so that's the new mass reading for that the second set of pennies added. Okay, so let's go ahead and get ready now for our third reading. Let's set that down. And add our third set of pennies to this. I think I could add one more. Let's Get that to the, see if that's good enough to get to our volume marking. There's an air bubble there, so let that disappear. Okay, I think it's gone. Let's see, that's a easy enough reading to make. Okay, hopefully, that, there we go, it refocused. Okay, so there's our new volume reading. Okay, so there's, so that's our volume reading with our fourth set of pennies in. And let's again get the mass of that. So there's our mass balance. Notice it's teared. Let's add in our graduate cylinder. There's the new mass. Okay, so make a note of that. Okay, and I think we can get one more set of readings by adding on our Last set of pennies. Yeah, I think we had a third penny there. Okay. That should be our fourth set of readings there. I think we started at about 
21 milliliters, and here we've gone to about 25, but anyway, I'll let you make that, that volume reading yourselves. Okay, so there's the new, our uh, fourth volume reading of once, or our fourth reading with pennies, I should say. Um, and let's go ahead and get a mass reading for that. So you can see here our mass balance is zeroed. We need to tear it. But let's add our graduated cylinder. And there's our new mass reading for our last set of our last set of uh, pennies we've added to this. Okay, so with that in mind, you should be able to figure out the mass of uh, you know of just your pennies once you subtract your mass uh, of just the water and graduated cylinder from the beginning. Uh, so you can see, you basically plot your graph of the mass of pennies versus the volume of just the pennies. So please note that the pennies themselves are only taking up uh, a few milliliters of volume. Okay, so be sure to subtract your 21 milliliters of volume from the beginning. Uh, once you've done that, you can then plot a graph of uh, your pressure, um, basically of your uh, mass versus volume uh, for your pennies themselves and draw a line of best fit accordingly. Okay, Let's draw a line of best fit. So from our data we want to get a, an average density of all of our different pennies. Right? Uh, there's going to be slight variations between our pennies due to just corrosion and you know just wear and tear uh, basically not all of our pennies are completely identical okay but that being said density is something that doesn't you know it doesn't matter if your mass or your volume is slightly off the density is relatively a constant okay now in order to average out all our pennies though uh, we could sit there and do a bunch of calculations add up our masses and add up our volumes and you know divide one by the other but another easier way to do this is to graph out our data and draw a line of best fit. Okay, so to do this, we first want to plot out our data. Um, I recommend having it spread out as much as possible. If your data points are clustered close together, it's really hard to draw a line of best fit. Uh, I find that having them spread out makes reading your data points a lot easier. Okay, so to do this, when you are determining the scale on which to enter your values on your um, x and y axes, uh, think about that range and think about spreading it out as much as possible. Ask yourself what's your minimum and maximum value and try and have them kind of on opposite ends of the graph. Okay, uh, don't come in with a sort of, uh, oh, I'm going to use one box for one value kind of mindset. So for example, on your x-axis, we're putting down the volume of our pennies, right? So again, once you've subtracted the volume of the, uh, of the water in your graduated cylinder, you have the volume of just the pennies, and you probably notice that that volume is a range of one to four milliliters, right? It's a, it's a very small change in volume. Pennies don't take up a lot of space. So if you picked one box per one milliliter, uh, you'd be kind of done by the time you got to like about here on your graph, right? Uh, which would make things really, really difficult because all of your data points would be clustered over here. So instead, what we want to do is we want to select more than one box for one milliliter. So maybe one of those small boxes is, you know, a quarter of a milliliter or 0.1 milliliter or something like that. But set it up so that your data points are spread out. Okay, so let's say we, uh, you know, again, I don't have graph paper in front of me. You'll have it on your lab report. Uh, but set it up so that your volume readings are spread across your axis. Okay, so we go from, let's say, 0 to 4, 0 to 5 milliliters, whatever your data points are. Have that spread out uh, accordingly, where, you know, you can easily figure out, um, you know, how much each uh, box corresponds to from a volume standpoint. Okay, uh, do the same thing for your mass, of course. Uh, determine what your mass of pennies are and pick, uh, you know, spaces on your y-axis accordingly to spread that out. Uh, and when you have done that, go ahead and plot your data points. Now, when you do this, they'll look something like this. Okay. 
Now, notice I have drawn uh, the, these, these data points increase in value, which makes sense. They, uh, the mass will increase and the volume increase as you add more and more pennies, right? Um, however, you'll notice that if you were to connect the dots like you normally would uh, with most graphs, you won't get a perfectly straight line. I mean, they're generally increasing in kind of that direction, but it's not going to be perfectly straight. You want to get a straight line. Uh, a straight line makes it easier to, uh, to read data, to make predictions, and so on. Um, so we're going to draw what's called a line of best fit using a straight ruler. Okay, so we want to set up our ruler so that our data points uh, deviate from that line we're going to draw by an even amount above and below the line. Uh, what I find is a good starting point is getting your, uh, your first data point and your last data point and then wiggling the ruler accordingly to see, uh, you know, to play around with that spacing. So you can see that when I start that off here, uh, both of my middle data points are kind of a little bit above that line. It might be a little hard to see on the video, but basically you can see that there's a little bit of space here. Um, maybe if I do that, it'll be a little easier to see there. Um, there we go. If I draw it that way, there's a little bit of space where these middle two points are not touching the ruler. Okay, So we want to try and maybe shift uh, this line up a little bit so that the space uh, that's above the line with these two middle points is about even with the space that's going to be below the line with those first and last points. Okay, So once we have this set up, we're going to keep that ruler down and draw our line, straight line of best fit. Okay. Okay. So not the the best line there. This may take a little bit of trial and error. Uh, you know, I recommend doing this in pencil. Uh, you know, and drawing your lines very lightly. Uh, but basically, you want something that looks kind of like this, where. Uh, again, you can see that there's a little bit of deviation. Some of your points might go through the line, but uh, you know, if you know, if some don't, like you can see, there's some deviation here. That's also okay. The key thing is that you use a ruler to draw your straight line of best fit, and you calculate your slope from the line itself and not from some of your previous data points. Okay, because you'll notice that not all of your data points are on the line. Some of them might be, like the second reading here is on the line itself. Uh, and if that's the case, then yes, if it's on your line, you may use that data point. But my advice is to pick points that are on your line that intersect with the grid itself uh, that make it a little bit easier to figure out what those mass and volume readings are. So if I'm looking at my line, and I'm looking at the grid, if I were to draw this in graph paper, I would look for places where it's a little bit easier to see the graph. So for example, let's say I have uh, the grid in my graph intersecting over here, okay? So where it's easy to see what this mass is and what this volume is, right? Uh, I would use that as one of my uh, data points, well, not a data point, but basically one of my graph points for determining the slope. Uh, you need a second point with which to do that. So again, you can pick, um, let's say, like this data point here since it's directly on the line. Or again, find another... Uh, point on the graph that matches up. Okay, so let's say over here, and I can figure out, okay, it's definitely this volume and it's definitely this mass. Um, use those, that difference in mass and that difference in volume to figure out the slope of your line. How to draw a line of best fit on a dry erase board, um, but I find that uh, perhaps it might be easier to explain this on my computer using your actual lab report. Um, just because you know, it might be easier to see what this looks like on the grid that's in your lab report. Now, I pointed out that you want to be careful of how you select your scale on your x and y axes because that will make your uh, you know, drawing the line of best fit easier or harder to do um, and also reading that graph and trying to uh, figure out um, you know, where data points line up or to read certain points in your graph, uh, that would be a little bit easier or harder depending again on the scale you're using. Right? So let me illustrate this. So for example, over here uh, we have about 30 boxes making our, um, 
our x, uh, you know, along the x-axis of our graph. So we want to be careful about, you know, falling into that trap of selecting one box per milliliter. Um, you probably noticed from your data that your copper pennies don't take up a very large volume. I think your range is about four milliliters in total. So if you were marking four milliliters on your graph, um, when you count that out, so if I were to mark this, all right, so here's a zero, uh, this marking over here is one, this marking over here is two, this marking is three, and this marking is four, you can see that we're done over here, and we've got all this empty space that's going to be wasted on our graph. All of our data points are going to be clustered over here on the left of our graph, and it's going to be really hard to pick out a line of best fit. All right. Um, similarly, if you look at your range of masses, um, if you uh, remember you want to subtract the mass of the water and graduate cylinder, you want just the mass of your pennies in your graph here, uh, you'll see that you've got a range of about 30 grams. Now, uh, I haven't counted these out, but I think this is fewer than 30 uh, squares over here. So you want to be careful about selecting one gram per box because you would run out of room here. You would have some of your data points out off your grid and again it would be impossible to graph those or I mean you could probably guess where you're graphing them but that's not very precise or not very accurate rather. And so again you want to be careful of the range you select here. Okay, um, For example on your y-axis instead of selecting one box per gram uh, maybe select one box for every two grams uh, then you only need about uh, 15 of these boxes to fill up this um, to you know, plot all your data fit it onto that y-axis so for example let's start plotting that out so let's say we had you no know, we selected uh, that as two grams that as four grams no, and so on. I could um, actually maybe I'll just save me a little time here. I'm going to just plot every 10. So every five of these is 10. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. That's 20. And then 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So that's about 30. Oops, there we go. So again, you've, you've, you're going to waste a little bit of space near the top, but the added benefit of, um, of using exactly one box for every two grams is that now it makes trying to count out um, you know, data points when we're trying to read our graph a little bit easier. Because every intersection uh, of this grid you know is going to be to within two grams. Or if you get to a point that's exactly midway, that's at one gram, that interval is of one gram. So again, that'll make graphing this out, or rather reading the graph a little bit easier. Uh, likewise, now we want to spread four milliliters roughly out amongst these uh, 30 squares. So let's say we use about 25 or even 20 of those squares. Um, you know, actually we could probably use 25 of them uh, and I'll spread that out pretty nicely. So let's use five of these boxes uh, to represent one milliliter. So one, two, three, four, five. So that box there is one milliliter. Each of these boxes then represents one fifth of a milliliter, or 0.2 milliliters. Okay, so that's again something that makes counting out or um, you know determining a very precise volume a little bit easier when it comes to reading our graph. So let's continue that on. One, two, three. Four, five. So there's two milliliters. One, two, three, four, five. Three milliliters. One, two, three, four, five. And four milliliters. Whoops. And we've used uh, about, uh, you know, we're going to have a little bit of wasted space over here, but again, not as terrible as wasting, you know, the bulk of the graph, the majority of the graph. And we've again spread our data points out uh, pretty decently uh, to help um, you know determine our line of best fit.
Now, I don't have the data in front of me, and in any case, I want you guys to plot your own data yourself. So I'm just going to make up some data here. But let's say we had uh, data points that look something and like we this. have a data point. You know, again, if we're measuring, you know, we had each of our uh, measurements at, you know, a milliliter mark, so one, two, three, and four milliliters. Um, so let's say we had one reading, you know, our highest reading was somewhere around here. Uh, let's say our second one was, you know, something along lines of here, you know, and, you know, over here was another one, and here was another one. Okay, whoops. Okay, now again, I'm kind of just making this up, um, but you would plot these data points exactly. Like, so for example, here, uh, this would be if you had a volume reading of two milliliters and a um, you know, a mass reading of tw or, yeah, 12.0, essentially. Okay, this one happens to be right on line. Actually, this looks like it's about 8.0 exactly. Um, you know, feel free to like, or sorry, 6.0 exactly. Um, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but, you know, plot them accordingly based on the scale you have over here. Okay, now, if you were to draw a line of best fit here, whoops, um, you can see that uh, basically, we could, if we tried connecting the dots between these, these would not be a straight line, all right? Uh, this would be kind of a slightly zigzagging line that generally moves in this direction. But we want to draw a straight line with a ruler that kind of matches all of these. So I'm going to draw a few lines just to show you how I'm kind of setting this up. Now, if I connected that first and last point, okay, exactly, or at least more or less as exactly as I can. Whoops, I've got to try and uh, be careful about using my uh, stylus here to accidentally just grab a data point. But let's say I did something like this. Oops, let's try that again. There we go. Okay, so there's my, my line of best fit. Um, actually, that's kind of a really good one because you can see that um, my data points, uh, my uh, if I look at the space where my points are deviating below the line, that's over here, and my space where the points are deviating above the line, uh, that's about even, you know. So if I had drawn a line of best fit, for example, that looks something like, you know, uh, let's say that I drew it a little bit off like this. If I drew it slightly off, you know, you know, like that, uh, you can see that now uh, all of my data points are on one side of that line. So that's not a good line of best fit, even though it is kind of following that trend. That's not a good line of best fit because all of my data points are on one side of that line. Okay. Uh, you also want to be careful about having too large a gap between your data points uh, or between uh, your line of best fit and your data points, even if that space is somewhat even. So for example, if I were to sort of connect these middle two lines, okay, these middle two points, um, I'm still, I've still got about the same amount of space between this data point and this data point. Uh, and my line of best fit, maybe a little bit more space over here, but you can see that this space between my data point and this line of best fit is much greater than the um, space between this other line of best fit. I should probably use a different color ink so you can see what I'm doing. Um, here, let's try that again with a different color ink just so I can show you the difference there. So if I were to draw it more like this, something like that, um, you can see that this space is off way more than uh, the deviation between this point and the line in red, right? So that's why this blue line is a worse line of best fit, okay? Even though it's kind of centered. So you want to select a line so that the amount of space uh, that your line is off from your data points is as low as possible. 
Okay. So, uh, yeah, and that's how you would draw a line best fit. Now, when it comes to doing this part of the of the lab over here, where you're trying to figure out the density of the metal graphically, you want to select a mass and a volume for two points. Okay, so mass number two and ma volume number two is from a data point that is your second, uh, well, a data point that is on your line or any point rather that's on your line. So if I were to use my line of best fit here as an example, okay, I would want to select something where uh, my line of best fit intersects with the grid to make reading that line pretty easy. So for example, um, this point over here is a really good point. So if I draw a little circle around there to remind myself that this is a data point I want to select, that intersection there with that grid is at exactly eight grams and exactly one point whoops one point two one point two milliliters. Okay. Likewise if I want let's say another data point. So this probably is a decent spot here. Uh, so let's draw a little circle there. Let's say I want to select that as my point number two. Okay, I'm at a mass of exactly twenty grams and a volume of exactly 2.8, um, oops, a little bit better, 2.8 uh, milliliters. All right, so I want to make sure that I have that, um, you know, I plot that accordingly in my calculation. So my mass number two of my point number two, right, so if this is point number two and this is point number one, um, my mass of point number two is 20 milliliter or 20 grams, okay? And I would subtract the mass of point number one, which is eight grams. Yeah, I'm going to give these to exactly the nearest whole number um, since that's the level of precision each of my boxes is. Each of my boxes goes to the nearest two grams. Um, for my volume, so volume of point number two is 2.8, and I would write that out as uh, 2.8, right, milliliters. And I would have to put exactly that number. I can't round that out to three, because again, the precision of my measurements here is to the nearest 0.2 milliliters. Each of these boxes represents 0.2 milliliters, so I have to go to that decimal place of, you know, that first decimal place. Um, likewise, volume uh, of point number one here is 1.2, so I would subtract 1.2 milliliters. And then I would work out that accordingly. So 20 minus 8 is 12 grams divided by a difference, now 2.8 minus 1.2, that's a difference of 1.6. Oops, I'm running out of room here. Let's uh, scroll down a bit so you can see this a little bit better. 1.6 milliliters. Um, and so then I can calculate that density accordingly. All right, just by taking 12 and divide by 1.6, and that's my density in grams per milliliter. Uh, I've kind of spread this out. I could do all this calculation in this blank here, but I'm just kind of, you know, just illustrating how this calculation is done. Um, again, hopefully you should get a value when you get the answer to this. It should be roughly equivalent to kind of uh, the calculations you got over here on the previous page. Uh, you might have a huge variation in each of these calculations and that's why drawing this graphically makes this a lot uh, quicker and easier. Okay, um, so again one of the things you want to watch out for when you're drawing uh, these, um, when you're drawing your line of best fit or rather when you're doing this calculation you want to take data points that are on your line. If you don't, if you were to select actual data points, this would throw off your calculations quite a bit. Uh, for example, if instead of using um, points on my line, I, well, I could use something like this point over here because that's pretty much on my line and this one too. But if I used one of these points here, which are off the line, and I tried to base my calculation here on that, uh, I would find that the slope would be way off. Instead of getting a, uh, a slope, you know, um, 
basically instead of getting a, um, a slope of the line that we kind of have drawn over here, we would get a slope that looks kind of like this. I would get a line that looks like that. Whoops, let's try that again. So if I connect those two points, I would be getting the slope of this line in blue rather than the slope of the line in red, which is what I want. All right, so this is why we don't use the data points from our experiment in our calculation of our slope. Okay, you want to take points that are on your line of best fit, not data points from this section of your experiment. Okay, all righty. Well, uh, that's it for this lab. Have fun.